The story of Job, in some ways, is the story of the human race. For all of us, the difficulties of life and the imperfections of creation highlight the gulf that separates humankind from God and his perfection. Job's quest to bridge the, that gulf was summarized poignantly when he asked, How can a man be righteous before God? Job 9.2 There it is, the human dilemma. How can sinful human beings be accepted by a holy God? Our natural human response to suffering or to sin is to try to undo whatever wrong may have originally caused our trouble. If we have done something that made us unrighteous in God's sight, then we think that doing the opposite should restore our righteousness. If we have done wrong, then certainly doing some good should make it right, shouldn't it? Unfortunately, Scripture tells us that in God's sight, committing, our, uh, committing one sin is equivalent to committing an infinite number of them. James 2.10 so our good works can never make up for even one transgression. Trying to undo sin by good works is a prescription for righteousness that leaves us falling hopelessly short. Because nothing can change the fact that you've done the one sin. It's run. The piece of paper has ink splattered on it. You can't undo that by doing something with white ink to counter the black ink on the white piece of paper. The paper is soiled, it's obvious, and there's nothing you can do to change that. Of course, God knew that we could not be justified by our own efforts, so he arranged to remove our sin himself. God gave to Israel and to the world through Israel access to a temporary state of reconciliation through ongoing sacrifices, as outlined in his law. The law had two purposes. First, it perpetually reminded people of God's standards and our inability to meet them. That is, our inability to make ourselves righteous before God. Second, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Galatians 3.24 As a tutor or teacher, the law revealed humanity's lack of righteousness so that when Jesus Christ came as the once and for all perfect sacrifice, our justifier by faith, Israel and the world at large would be ready to embrace him. This is a key part of Paul's letter to the Jews and Gentiles in the region of Galatia. Although these men and women had embraced the gospel of faith in Christ, they were being persuaded that their faith alone was not enough, and so they needed to add certain works of the law in order to be saved, a step backwards in their spiritual growth. Paul even had to correct the apostle Peter in Galatians 2, 11-21 and Matthew 26, 69-75, and the stalwart Barnabas, Galatians two thirteen, on this topic. Paul was direct, even blunt. I do not set aside the grace of God, as you, Peter, are doing. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Galatians 2.21 Why would Christ need to die for our unrighteousness if we could earn our way back to God by our own efforts? That would make his coming unnecessary. To add human works to faith would be, as Paul said, to set aside the grace of God. There is no need for grace if our good deeds could be sufficient for righteousness. In his argument against Peter and the Galatian Judaizers, Paul concludes that being justified comes only through the work of Christ, and not through any human effort. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20 In his commentary, The Message of Galatians, John R. W. Stott, Summarized justification by faith as God's act of unmerited favor by which he puts a sinner right with himself, not only pardoning or acquitting him, but accepting him and treating him as righteous. Acts 13, 38 and 39 and Romans 1, 17. The only way we can be declared righteous is by putting our faith in God's provision, Jesus Christ the righteous, 1 John 2, 1. And we do that by accepting him as Savior. You can do that right now. You just... Except that you're a sinner and you pray to God and you say that you are a sinner and that you believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God eternally, who died on the cross and rose again in your place. For Romans 3.23, 5.8, and 10.9 says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And of course in Romans 10.13 it says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's a promise in Hebrews 13.5. 5. 